We're live. Hello, friends. Welcome to Be Waste Wise. I am Shweta Dandapani. I am the community builder at Be Waste Wise. Um, as you all know, we are a nonprofit organization. We are trying to address the gap in uh, knowledge dissemination on the subject of waste, recycling, climate change, and sanitation. And uh, today, our the topic of the panel today is pandemic effects on recycling budgets in the USA. This is based on a regularly updated series on Waste Dive, where they're trying to follow up on curbside recycling programs all over the USA. And according to their story, nearly 100 local governments have canceled or indefinitely paused their curbside recycling programs due to cost pressures and other issues. So uh, we have Cole Rosenblum, who's the senior editor at Waste Dive. He's moderating today's panel. He's going to be talking to Vita Quinn. She is from SES Engineers and Vincent Leray, who's the Community Program Coordinator at the Recycling Partnership. We have received your questions in advance, passed it on to the panelists as well. They will try to work it into the conversation today. If, uh, if your questions are not answered or you have any new questions, please use the Q&A box. And uh, that's about it. I'll drop the link to the story on Waste Dive on chat. You can archive it, you can have a look at it and then post your questions too. So over to you, Cole. Thank you, um, Swita, and thanks to Be Wastewise for hosting today. Good morning, everyone. We appreciate um, you joining us. So, yeah, as um, as mentioned, this is something that we have been watching uh, throughout the year and in prior years. You know, as um, the financial underpinnings of how you know municipal recycling works have really changed quite a bit in the past few years. As folks well know, I won't rehash the whole um, China market situation, but you know we've seen a lot of changes in how contract structures work, how much things cost, how much money can be expected to be made from these programs that has upended um, contracts quite a bit already. Um, and then heading into this year, the pandemic has really exacerbated that in some areas. Um, we saw where programs perhaps are on the edge of deciding whether or not to continue the budget effects of the pandemic did put them over the edge or in some cases where um, uh, outbreaks led to operational challenges, you know, extended uh, absences or staffing issues that has led some cities and some programs to um, indefinitely pause, not cancel, but indefinitely pause their programs. Um, and so that is something we're tracking on our website, but we recognize it's um, quite a complicated topic. And there's a lot of reasons, often case by case, why cities make this move. It's a, it's a hard decision, something that the residents often want to continue. Um, and that's what we hope to explore today, kind of what, why that has been happening and some possible solutions that are being pursued and maybe what we can expect heading into next year. Um, so to start it off, I wanted to turn to you, Vincent, um, because as folks may have seen with that, um, the link that Swayda dropped, we um, worked closely with the Recycling Partnership to kind of compare data and see what they've been, you know, noticing on the municipal um, cancellation or pause front. Um, what have you seen this year, Vincent, um, driven particularly by the pandemic for cities taking this step? Sure. Um, so hello, everyone. Thank you, uh, WasteWise, for having us. Um, as mentioned, I'm a community program coordinator for the Recycling Partnership. We're another um, national nonprofit based in the U.S. working to help municipalities with their programs. And uh, I think one of the key trends that I sort of wanted to bring up at the forefront is um, that this has been somewhat independent of size and geography. Um, we're seeing very small villages and hamlets struggling with this. We're seeing major metropolitan areas struggling with this. And so um, as we sort of move into this discussion, I would, I would kind of keep that, or I will personally strive to keep it top of mind um, because as we, there's a lot to think about in recycling versus in regards to like rural recycling or multifamily. You know, there's a lot of complexity no matter where you are. Um, and this has really added to it at all scales. Um, another kind of complexity that we've seen as we sort of attempt to collate the data and put it together and tell a story is um, knowing where the cause and effect starts and stops. You know, so maybe there is the pause with uh, due to market that got extended due to the pandemic, or you know, there's stops and starts, and there are you know or just a pause due to the pandemic that, you know, when, when we think about access, if you haven't had, had access to your curbside for eight months, is that still access anymore? Is that a pause program or is that a closed program? Um, and so I would, I, I think that's the trend mostly that I've noticed is that it goes across the board. Um, of communities are struggling with a lot of different factors 
and uh, often they themselves don't know what is the long-term you know kind of reality of their program if there's just too many factors um, to really nail it down confidently um, i know we'll get more into that so i'll leave it there and uh back to you Paul. well thank you for those introductory thoughts um vita turning to you you know um scs obviously works closely with communities brought in as an expert to consult on this from the you know the budget standpoint what what are you hearing from these folks that you're talking to this year what are some of the pressures and the the factors they're weighing when they do have to make these decisions we're we're definitely seeing the conversation shift a little bit um i mean obviously as you understand there's only so much expense cutting you can do just in a regular budget without you know being forced to address either your revenue stream or your operational changes to be able to to handle some of these shifts that we're seeing um, in solid waste management plans, we're seeing that it may not be as cost effective, obviously, to, to continue a recycling program as they would want it to be. You know, it's not the free service. We've always led our residents to believe that it was, but that there would be a significant community backlash in many situations if recycling was removed altogether. So we're looking at alternatives um, in some examples not changing recycling service as much as what happens if we cut down on the frequency of our solid waste service? Can we then afford to keep up some of these programs? So there's there's shifts there. As far as revenue streams, obviously people are wanting to avoid large rate increases, but we are finding that it is not stopping people from doing rate studies, really looking at where are the cost of our services is and are we recovering it from the right person? Because elected officials are obviously looking at those on fixed incomes or those in the community that are being most affected right now. And you know, can we do something to take the burden off of them while still recovering the revenue that we have to actually have to operate? I mean, I could talk to more, but we'll get into that. Yeah, no, thank you. That I think that helps lay it out. Um, and maybe one, you know, I mentioned it in passing, but I think, and I'm sure a lot of the folks listening are familiar, but maybe it would be good for us to just walk through sort of what in the last couple of years, what has happened from a financial standpoint for recycling. Cause to me, that seems to be sort of the baseline, you know, COVID would have been hard no matter what, but have that coming right after a uh, historic shakeup in recycling markets. Not that it hasn't happened before, but you know, this municipal programs were still adapting to that. And depending on where you were with your contract, maybe it hadn't come up yet. Um, so I'll turn this to either of you, you know, Vincent or Vita wants to speak to this, but you know, what what have you seen over pre-COVID past couple of years, how the financial conversation had just changed about expectations about how much recycling should cost, who should pay for it and whether it could be, should be viewed as a revenue uh, operation or just an expense at this point. Vincent, you wanna take that? Yeah, I, I can jump in and, um... And so one, I think what has been a big change that a lot of folks are, are coming to understand is um, we've mentioned it before, but that it should not necessarily be an expectation anymore to get revenues back from a recycling contract or for that to be a free service. Um, across the board, we're seeing processing charges become just part and parcel of a standard recycling contract where that's not always been the case. Um, and so we, at the partnership, we have a, a best management practices document that kind of goes in more into that, but that's been a big wake up call for a lot of programs who've had, you know, who came off a 10 year contract and all of a sudden they go to renew and the terms are, are very, very different. Um, and so that has been, um, that's been partly a budget issue, but it's also been, um, Vita, as you mentioned, a, it's a communication issue. We have sort of grown up a, a generation of Americans to think one way about recycling and, and that way isn't as relevant anymore. And so we're needing to um, sort of realign where it falls in our priority list. A lot of the time we're seeing recycling get cut um, in lieu of, of, of uh, strengthening kind of trash collection. You know, that is always um, a, a higher tier service than recycling due to potential, you know, health and vector things, and that's fair and that's fine, but um, but as communities have to start to pay more outright for recycling, they are starting to expect it to be a service that 
you know, meets its schedule, that meets its deliverables, like like the other services we pay for. Um, and so now that I think that has been a big change is, you know, once it's, if it's not going to be free and we're going to pay for it and there's going to be taxes and we're not going to get a revenue, then residents expect it to work on time, you know, things like that. And so I think that's been a big change. Not only are communities having to kind of readjust their budget expectations, but it's a, it's a big hurdle. I don't want to say hurdle. Um, it is something communities have to focus on as well. Um, in tandem to that is, is realigning their residents' expectations. You know, to what you were saying about the, the contracts being renewed and some of those changes, it's astounding some of the changes. Um, you know, recycling may at a programmatic level have been a loser, but you often had at least recycling processing fees that were low enough and, and sales that were enough to make it seem like a break even uh, on a ton basis. And, and what you have now is as these contracts are coming up and these processes processes are having to deal with the changing markets. We're seeing tipping fees now or processing fees that are well in excess of the regular tipping fees. So it now becomes a very tough thing to take that you, it would be less expensive, less hassle burden on the utility to just take it straight to the landfill. And it's, it's really changing how they look at programs. Um, and I think you know, to what we were talking about operationally, it does have to become a service. It now has to, to justify those additional costs. And in certain areas like California, uh, they're also adding to that with some of the recent regulations where there's now significantly more involved in continuing to process, uh, you know, green waste, organics, recyclables. Um, staying on that for a minute, I would be interesting to hear. So right, clearly the processing fees are going up, contract structures are changing. And I imagine in some communities, as we've seen with this list here, some have made the decision, okay, but for us at this time, we, you know, it's not worth continuing. Many others though, the vast majority, I should say, right, of curbside recycling programs in the US continue, uh, are working not, not without some challenges and some pain, but they're still running. Um, be curious to hear from either of you, maybe what other metrics you've seen municipalities look at um, either in terms of they think they can still save money long term and to, you know, preserving disposal capacity, perhaps, or the factors like that, or um, trying to meet maybe their sustainability goals, climate goals, um, you know, some of the other reasons why they are still continuing on with these programs, even though just that particular line item on the budget of recycling may look different than it did before. Vincent, do you want to take that one to start off? Um. Yeah, I'm sorry though. I was reading the chat that had a cue for Vincent, so we just uh, I was trying to wrap my head around that. So, uh, do you mind just like give me the last? Yeah, five yeah of course. Um, sort of what other factors? You know, if so, recycling appears more expensive than it is now. Um, but what other factors, financial or perhaps sustainability goals, um, are you seeing municipalities take into effect for why they're keeping on with recycling? Um, yeah. So what has what we've seen is communities have really, I think they're starting to move towards um, a longer view of sustainability. I think when sustainability sort of first became a buzzword and first got into our kind of collective municipal conscience, it was about um, kind of smaller things. It's, you know, LED lighting and these really like quick, quick ROI type of um, situations. Whereas now, um, I'm seeing a lot of things about preserving landfill space and, you know, you know, which might have 50 years left, but that city intends to grow. They've got a new development coming in and all of a sudden these, these layers start coming on where, you know, they've got 50 years left in their landfill now, but their city 25 years from now isn't going to have 25 years left. Um, and so we're, ha I think communities are starting to take a, a longer view of, of um, solid waste sustainability. Um, and as well, I've, I've seen uh, just a little bit of talk about um, sort of moving towards not only a, a sustainable like city, but region. I've been really interested in kind of the regionalization of some solid waste, whether it be contracts or districts or um, however you like to, you know, there's a few different ways to frame that. But um, so there's been a few times where really, really small communities that said, well, everyone around us is doing this. Like, we don't want to be the, the kind of gray spot on the sort of regional sheen. 
Uh, and so, and which I like, I, I like that sustainability is, is kind of, can kind of reflect off itself. And, um, but really that's, I think that's been a big part of it. The residents expect it. And, you know, there's only so many times you can go to a public city council meeting and be harangued about the recycling service that your residents are paying for, for you decide to keep it. And you might have to raise rates, um, you know, center, center county, uh, Pennsylvania just did that now. The CRA is a very successful, very, you know, solid um, resource authority. And they're having to raise rates and they've been very good and professional and, and open and, and that's just part of it. And so um, I'm not sure what else is driving it besides kind of a, a, a mean to, I think most people in most cities uh, and most municipalities, you know, 99.9% .9 want to provide the best service they can for the residents. And I think we kind of, as a collective whole, decided that recycling is one of those services. I, I, I almost think it could just be as simple as that. Well, even just from a pure financial perspective, I mean, <clears throat> it doesn't go away if you choose to discontinue a recycling program. So you have to look at the financial impacts as well. There's an immediate budgetary impact. So for example, if you're on a pay as you throw program and you have a lot of customers with small containers, now you're looking at an entire cart replacement program for your municipality because you don't want to recycle anymore. And you can look at privatizing it. We've definitely had cities considering that. It doesn't discontinue the program. It just gives residents a suite of options that, that move some of that financial burden off of the municipality. Um, so there may be some alternatives there where you could work together to still encourage that that recycling but maybe not have to continue to run the program but it, it just really isn't financially feasible to wipe it out entirely unless you're really ready for that and in communities you know where i work in states that may allow multiple large containers they still find that those residents tend to throw away a lot and their containers are overflowing as it is so i, I just i don't see any communities that think it would be easy to just abolish a program like that I love that Vita and and one thing that we come back to a lot is you know the the material the amount doesn't change you know the set the household x household is still going to send y amount of material somewhere and so you're always going to be managing that same cart load it's just whether it's going to a landfill or to a processor and back into the economy um, and so yeah I just think that's a really important factor that this is you know with or without a recycling program people are still drinking out of recyclable cans and using detergent and recyclable you know bottles like none of that's changing without a, you know even if a program goes away no those are, are good points um a note to folks who are watching uh, thank you for your questions so far please feel free to keep them coming um direct them toward the q a uh, box at the bottom of your screen and we'll do our best to work those in uh through the remainder of the hour one other kind of foundational question that I would, you know, be great to get in some details on solutions you've seen or um, anticipate. Something I'm just wondering. Obviously, no one can predict where the pandemic's going, right? We would be foolish to do so. But just kind of based on what you've been hearing from cities this year, as they've gone through the budget cycle, do you think folks who are going to run into these tough decisions about pausing and ending a program because of the pandemic effects have we mostly seen that, or do you think this is a conversation that carries on well into? 21 and 22, as cities kind of struggle with where recycling fits from a financial standpoint. Maybe that's something you can pick up on, Vito. Yeah, not even specific to recycling, but <clears throat> remembering that recycling always exists, at least in the United States, within a solid waste or sanitation fund or department, or at least in conjunction with them. And those may operate two ways. They may operate at as an enterprise fund, which means their charges for services are supposed to help them be self-sustaining without interaction with the general fund. Or they could be a solid waste department where they are essentially funded through the general fund of the city or county. In both cases, however, unlike water and wastewater, we tend to find that a lot of solid waste utilities are underfunded. So even in often in cases where they're enterprise funds, they are reliant on general funds. And I say that just because I have been preaching this, but it is very true. We have to take a step back. This is not about solid waste and recycling. This is about what's happening in the economy and how does that, how do those funds then flow? Because who is being hit immediately and will have a longer lasting effect are the municipalities themselves. In areas, I'm in Florida where there's a lot of tourism, 
um, you know, sales tax revenues decline, tourist taxes decline. So that has an immediate impact. But then as we have continued unemployment, right now we're seeing still a housing boom. But what happens when there begins to be foreclosures and depending in certain areas of the country, some may be harder hit than others, and then property tax values then decline. That's a lagging revenue stream. You know, you're getting taxed this year for last year's property value. So we're going to see the effects for two or three years. And depending on how long the lag in the economy lasts, it will be, you know, one to two years past whenever we see a full recovery. So it's worth considering that to the extent that these utilities are dependent on general fund monies, they're going to be expected to tighten their belt in a similar way to what the cities and counties themselves are having to do. Very helpful context. Thank you. So it sounds like this, this conversation is not going away anytime soon. Um, is there anything you'd want to add on that, Vincent, from what you've been hearing? Uh, the only thing I would add is that uncertainty is expensive, um, whether for, from a from an economic point, from a, from a planning and logistics point. Um, so we have these, uh, Vita, I love what you were saying about these like lagging costs and, and framing that up for us. And, um, and I would just say that one of those immediate costs is, you know, someone, if you have your staff is sick, so you have to hire new staff. Philadelphia had a, um, just had to hire a ton of new staff because they've had so many staff outages that takes time and money. And, and so like, not only does, not only is the problem very, very expensive, but even making the first steps to addressing the problem is expensive. Um, or Vita, you also mentioned, you know, new car programs, you know, that's a, that's an infrastructure, you know, so like, even if, if we at the partnership, we try to work with communities to, to make their programs more efficient. We've got anti-contamination work, we have grants for um, carts and other types of, of infrastructure, but those all take money in the fund to, you know, it takes a little bit of money to reduce the cost of your program. It takes money to make your program more efficient to reduce those costs. And so um, that has been a kind of a, a um, an anxiety among some communities who who know what's wrong, know what they want to do to fix it, and just don't because they can't. Not because there's any lack of, of will or passion or, or want. Just they don't have the opportunity to fix their programs. Yeah. Um, thanks, folks, for the questions coming in. I'll start taking some of those as we work through our program. Um, I can take this one and anyone else feel free to jump in. What percentage of programs have been canceled? A uh, very small percentage. Um, I'll admit I don't, that was not a not a, a statistic we were able to uh, complete in time for the story. Maybe I don't want to put you on the spot, Vincent, but we're talking thousands of programs. I don't know. I should know this. I don't know how many curbside recycling programs in the U.S. there are many thousands. And so a hundred out of that is quite a small fraction. Um, and out of that hundred, it's a smaller fractions still that have been paused. Um, that said, some of the ones that have paused are larger cities, whereas the permanent cancellations generally are smaller cities. There are some with populations over a thousand that have canceled or indefinitely without a contract. Um, but for context, yes, this so far anyway, this is a very small share of the programs out there that have taken this step. Am I, did I miss anything there, Vincent, you'd want to add? Uh, only I've, it's, it's, a, it's an approximate number, but I've seen floated around, you know, a little less than 1%. Okay. Um, and so it's, but it, it, we're, it's, a, it's a big conversation even for 1% because those 1% deserve access and the service they pay for. And so, so I, I don't like that 1% statistic because I think it sort of undervalues what is actually going on. But that's, a, I saw that somewhere. I can't cite it, I'm sorry. No, that, that tracks. And I guess too, to further round that out, this, um, and there's still, of course, communities that don't have curbside recycling. Um, some rural areas, of course, maybe drop off makes more sense, but there are still sizable populations that don't have curbside. So that, you know, that was already in the mix as well. Um, one other one in the chat box, um, I'll admit, I don't know the answer to this, but I'll turn it to either of you in case you do. Um, with COVID, some county contracts with haulers have had to be readjusted to provide additional financial assistance for PPE and hazard pay, um, how should future contracts be crafted to avoid those unforeseen events? Um, and I just, I'm curious, is that, you know, does the average contract allow room for um, such kind of one-off or uh, emergency cost increases? Vincent Navita, have you heard of anything like this happening? 
I haven't heard about that specifically, um, but one thing that we sort of stress, again, I'll kind of hawk our own best manager practice guide for contracts, um, but as much as possible, we really push communities to be in, you know, in partnership with their processors, um, somewhat for this reason, um, because it is such a, a dynamic space, it's very hard to maintain a strictly vendor relationship. You need to be, you know, you need to be in discussion, you need to be getting audit material, audit data back. Um, you need to be talking about, um, you know, changing um, kind of material types. Like, and so what, as we as we think about um, new and, and changing contracts with processors, um, I would try to put partnership at the forefront of that, whether it's monthly or quarterly meetings, because um, I think a lot of these uh, those kind of nitpicky details are best ironed out with your local processor, you know, in community and discussion, um, because it's, I think it's going to be very hard to craft a, a contract anticipating a global pandemic, you know, like that's just not something that we write in Maybe some people write that into their uh, underwriting of contracts, but I don't expect most municipalities do. Yeah, I think it's it's kind of focused more on on beginning to account for the unexpected. I mean, changes in the recycling markets, changes in your cost to provide services. That there's always language in a contract for that. It's how you stop the bleeding, essentially. You know, at what point can you come back mid-year? Can you? Uh, how is the how is the annual increase in that contract determined? Is it based on you know actual expenses prior year or something? You know, there. I think it's just looking at the language and how you frame the contracts. Looking at it, you know, from the perspective of just a global pandemic would be too myopic to tie into a long-term contract. Um, yeah, and this isn't directed earlier, but I, Force Majora comes to mind. I did see some MERFs in California briefly discuss it at the very beginning in terms of just not being able to accept um, inbound material on a temporary basis. Um, but it, to my knowledge, I'm, it could well be happening. I have not heard of Force Majora getting exercised over this, but who knows? It, that could be something that comes up, I wonder, too. Um, you know, in thinking about solutions, because obviously right, I'm sure a lot of uh, folks watching this are either running programs or represent folks who are running programs, and they are struggling right now to figure out what to do here. Um, in, we've touched on some of them. I think some of the best practices are already to save money, reducing can, contamination, things along those lines. Um, have any other solutions become more common that you've seen this year? Or do you think maybe folks will be, or perhaps you're pitching them? Heading into next year, I'm thinking about um, going to buy weekly recycling collection, for example. I've heard that talked about in some areas. Um, other, other things along those lines that you think uh, places are considering or should consider to try to help mitigate this, but keep their program near term? Um, I can start with this one. Yep, please. We've tried to shift the focus away from expense-based solutions to revenue-based ones, just because, like I said, after you've made your operational changes, and I think these are universal, you know, I'm not saying anything new when I talk about people making sure the crews don't have contact with one another and that you've you know, tried to manage your overtime and shifted your routes and anything that you can do right now to compensate, not only keep people safe, but save money. And at that point, you've done what you can. Now you're looking to revenues and some of that is potentially, what have we not been charging for? Or what are we not maximizing in terms of other revenue streams that we have available to us? So again, if, if recycling is housed within a, a broader sanitation utility, are there fees, are there charges for things that are unscheduled or, or other special things that we provide that are technically still free to residents again, other large pickups, things that may be costly. It, it's amazing when you do that over a course of a year, how much those services can add up to, to help to mitigate that. And then we've had a lot of conversations with clients about what kind of federal funds are available right now. Um, because your, your incremental costs right now may be your people and the PBEs and everything associated with them, but any savings that you have in another area then frees up money to be able to pay for that. So looking at any federal funds available you know, for reimbursement, and I know we've talked about the CARES Act or FEMA reimbursements potentially for certain things, 
um, but us, other grants and other funding sources that may be available for um, shovel ready projects. So it does require sometimes, you know, that you have capital ready, but then you can have matching funds or grant funds that again can free up money to be able to, to fund other parts of your operations. Gotcha. I'm glad you mentioned that just to follow up and then please feel free to jump in, Vincent. It sounds like right for as far as CARES Act funding, there have been cases, right? But for the most part, that is not going to be a direct fix for funding your recycling program, right? It's not intended necessarily to be used for operational expenses. And we know states are strapped at the moment too. Is that an accurate interpretation, Vita, that that federal funding could help you in other sides of the budget and in turn have the secondary benefit of helping your recycling program, but that funding is not often flowing as an option for this, right? It could potentially be, you know, you look at the language, we're not technically frontline workers, but when you, you look at some of what was in that language, that it would cover additional personnel expenses. So anything that's directly pandemic related. So if there were, was temporary labor or other things that were directly related to this. Um, and an interesting clause in there is that you could essentially stock up before these funds expire because goods that are delivered during the covered period can be used outside of that period. So for example, bulk purchases of some of these PPEs could be used later on. So there definitely are things within that. Um, the FEMA language has, it seems to be a bit broader. It really, um, again, if we're looking at the cost of the people, uh, emergency work for unbudgeted employees is, is often eligible. I mean, it's, it's hard to say in, in any, you know, broadly across the board how those funds could potentially be used, but there definitely are circumstances where it's worth looking at that language and seeing if there's the chance to, to, to maximize what you can use those funds for. That's good to know. That reminds just a quick that I do recall seeing some um, municipalities in Virginia using CARES Act funding for hazard pay for their um, city sanitation employees. And I know there's talk in other cities about using it for other purposes. I don't know where that went. Um, Vince, is there anything you want to add on there? Is there, have you heard any talk of federal funding being beneficial for cycling programs, uh, pandemic related funding? Uh, I haven't really. Um, I, I shopped this around to a few folks at the partnership because um, kind of legislation and funding is really not my forte. And um, most folks, you know, sort of mentioned sort of what Vita said, like there's an opportunity there, um, we think. But I haven't seen a lot of, neither me nor my colleagues have seen a lot of, of action around it. Um, so those, those municipalities in Virginia is the first time hearing of it. But it's a good thing to check into. Yeah. Um, and along those lines, I think it's something the three of us had talked before the webinar, but it would be good just to kind of reaffirm this for folks listening. You know, in terms of other available funding, as far as we know anyway, there's not state funding coming for this. It could be, you know, but states are also struggling right now and are looking for funding from the federal government. So outside of existing grant programs, which could well be beneficial, as you point out, be to just, off, you know, if you get money to uh, help launch the new compost site or do this or that or cart, so that all helps. It's money you're not spending elsewhere, but it's not pandemic related for operational expenses that we are aware of anyway, right? It doesn't right. seem like yeah, I think that's and correct. A lot of what comes from states is going to be things like your share of sales tax revenues and other things that, again, they're being hit the same way the cities are. So there isn't a giant slush fund there that's just being unspent this year. Right, right. Yeah, and, um, you know, and there have been some good, you know, there has been some exciting news on the state grants. Um, as, as we mentioned on the call, just to reaffirm here, you know, Indiana, I think, just released several grants. Um, but again, yeah, those are always those are only available to sit to municipalities that can take advantage of them, um, and it's it's too hard of a of a internal process to to try to change a state grant to not be reimbursement based or to you know no longer go to infrastructure but to go to operations, um, and so I I don't anticipate that many, if any, states have that flexibility with an existing grant program. And then, um, as we've mentioned, you know, Vita, you said that states are getting hit the same way, which means they don't have the money to build a new grant program to, to respond to this. Um, and so, and so there, are, there is grant money out there. We have, please apply to our grants, but, um, but there, 
there, there's always going to be that initial hurdle, almost always, of them being reimbursement based, unless we can put together a, a, a large enough partnership to cover those costs. But, but again, it's still reimbursement based. So um, we have done that before. We've had some success there, but not as much of a pandemic. Another um, thought about reaching outside of the utility itself, though, is um, you know I mentioned even within your operation, you can look for maybe miscellaneous revenues or ways to optimize revenue streams that you have. Taking one step out from that, whatever city or county we're talking about can also do the same thing. Look at indirect cost allocations. That's where all the departments pay one another, right? So if, if you're collecting the solid waste and recycling from the entire city, the city should be reimbursing you for that or various departments should be reimbursing one another. Ask when was the last time this cost allocation was updated? Is this it's a fair allocation of funds. A lot of times at a municipal level also permits will uh, allow for solid waste services at large events. Are those permit fees adequately recovering those costs? Because that could be hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Um, just looking at potentially any of those fees and charges and interdepartmental um, dependencies and questioning whether those have been updated recently because what no one wants to do is raise taxes or raise fees on the average resident. So, uh, but specific things like that, um, you know, maximizing any of the permitting fees or any other miscellaneous charge that are not, that are voluntary, are a, a good way to recover some additional revenue. That's a great point. That makes a lot of sense. Um, Turning to some of um, the audience questions that are coming in this one, you know, not pandemic related, but I think it's relevant as it kind of speaks to some of the underlying factors. We've been discussing, um, I'll just read the question, as processing costs rise and commodity values decline, has anyone measured the relationship between the two? Has the rise in processing costs equal that should pass the revenue decline? Um, do either of you have thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Has the rise equal? It would be hard to tell without being on that side of the numbers. But I will say, you know, anecdotally, it seems that the revenue decline happened rather immediately. Um, processing cost changes were, I think, what you were talking about earlier, Vincent, tied to contracts. So there may have been a lag in seeing that. But, um, I don't really know. Yeah, same. I, it's a good question. I think it's worth studying. Um, it does seem like in some cases, the processing costs have gone up quite sharply. And you wonder if, you know, and this is just the nature of contracts, whenever the contract was getting negotiated, whatever the market conditions were at that moment, six months, a year ago, we're sort of informing what the contractor was asking for. And maybe if market conditions have improved or worsened, and in some commodities, they have improved this year, right? Not all of them, but some. And that, but you're, you're baked in with that contract structure. I've noticed some though, you know, will have a certain mechanism for if commodity value reaches X amount, there might be a revenue sharing option still, you know, it's less common than it used to be, but it, again, it's case by case, but I have seen even in contracts where processing costs have gone up quite a bit, there is still the option for the municipality to benefits if, you know, commodity revenue is really going another direction. Um, that said, it, it's not as favorable as it used to be. I can tell you that much. Um, if, if I may add a quick kind of note to that, uh, as we think about processing costs, I guess I want to quickly point out that there's also often an added, like, if, if the, there's an added fee for landfill, if the contamination rate is high enough. Mm -hmm. um, so not only has that rate also gone up as well, um, but I would caution that any anyone listening who has a, a contamination rate built into their um, a contamination fee built into their contract, um, you should be getting audit data back with regularity to support that. Um, you should not just be getting invoices for contaminate or for landfill recyclables um, without having something to back that up. And so if you are, you know, reach out to your processor, have a phone call and, and dig into that. Um, and that's all. Actually, that prompts the thought just off the cuff. I wonder, you know, with residential weights being up, uh, they were up quite a bit and still up now and more folks being at home and this and that. I wonder if there is, that is a low hanging fruit. Granted, it's hard to find money for anything these days, but to re-engage with residents around um, what's considered 
contamination, you know, to avoid those fees if folks are at home recycling when they'd normally be at work recycling or there's more takeout containers or PPE or just, I wonder if there's ripe for challenges of contamination costs going up if folks aren't careful. Have you heard anything along those lines? In some places where I've worked, it's not even just a fee. They have the right to reject you entirely. So that presents a huge problem. There is, was an immediate outreach to residents to try and explain that the, the cost of this and that we have to you know, reduce this contamination. Now, granted, the client I'm thinking of that I talked about this with is in California where they're already facing you know, the need for public understanding of the expectations. But nonetheless, um, it, it became a, a real concern for them and outreach is really the best way to do that education. And on that, um, we have a, here at the partnership, we have a feed on the street campaign. We have a, we have a anti-contamination toolkits that are, that are free. Um, we have a DIY sign, step grade signage that's free. Um, and then you can also reach out to me directly or, or really anyone at the partnership, any of the community program coordinators to talk about it. Um, so there are tools and resources out there to, to help you bring that contamination down. Um, and, and we, you know, there are some, uh, some uh, municipalities that have used like the Keep America Beautiful Network for, to do like little volunteer car tagging routes. Um, and so I do think that the bright side of all of this is that contamination is uh, a directly addressable issue. Like we can educate residents, we can um, get the right mixes of things. And, um, and just kind of as a, as a future thought, as, as more and more materials um, get designed for recyclability, uh, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, in, in the future term, I'm hoping that contamination goes down because there's less opportunity to contaminate because more things can flow through the system, more things are designed for it. Um, we do, a lot of folks do some work in that arena, ourselves included, but, um, at least for me, I, I, I try to bring as many bright spots into the pandemic as I can, and and the ability to reduce contamination is one like that is an approachable, achievable thing with you know with important direct impacts on local programs. So, so check it out if, if anyone is listening that's interested. That's good to know. Um, turning again to some questions uh, we've received multiple about these uh, both ahead of the webinar and during the webinar. So can tell there's some interest here, you know, as far as future um, policy changes um, at the state or federal level that folks think or hope could change the financial outlook of their programs, um, extended producer responsibility, EPR, is coming up more and more often. Um, one question that I'll just, I can briefly address is sort of where, where does it stand? Um, there was a federal bill introduced this year. It has not moved, um, not expected to move. Um, that bill, the um, Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act is um, expected to be reintroduced. Next year, the sponsors just sent a letter about that the other day. So we can expect to see that come back in Congress. Um, doesn't go anywhere, who knows? Um, at state level is viewed as more fertile for proponents of this. Um, no states passed it, many got close, largely just because legislative sessions were curtailed or overtaken by you know pandemic um, priorities, but um, expected that numerous states um, will either reintroduce bills or introduce new bills next year around this. And there, we're noticing some shifting in stances, both from CPG companies and um, uh, MRF operators and haulers on the on the concept, still going to be contentious and challenging to get one done. But folks think maybe this could change the funding picture. Um, Vincent, I know you don't work on policy that much. Um, but Vita, is there anything you'd want to add? Are you hearing this as something municipalities are hoping for or think could help their financial outlook? So this may be a little off topic, but I did I did work with a facility in Vermont that was dealing with um, some food waste legislation regarding, um, you know, the handling of it, and it resulted in a in a public-private partnership where they would essentially contribute capital for a depackaging facility to be able to handle, you know, some of this food waste. So I, I you know, it's maybe, while maybe a little off from exactly what you're asking, it's it's the finances that drive this. I mean, I hate to sound overly capitalist, but you have to make it to where there is some sort of financial incentive to take action. This was a company taking it on themselves to say, this is going to cost less for me and let me meet regulations and not have to run into legal problems. Um, I think, you know, if you draft it correctly, 
people will find a way to, to be creative and, and to, you know, do those, take those diversion initiatives and other things that they need to. Gotcha. Yeah, we'll see what happens here. I think, you know, even among the groups that perhaps were opposed in the past that are coming around one um, thing they've outlined is that, you know, they want to see the funding, you know, the existing structure stay in place, but the funding go to help municipalities in some form. And I'm broadly simplifying that for any EPR experts who are listening. I recognize that. Um, I think one note on that might just my own thought from talking to people, even if something does pass next year, it's not going to take effect immediately, right? It's going to be a long, there's going to be a rulemaking process. The stewardship organization is going to need to be set up. We're probably multiple years away from funds flowing to municipalities, I would expect anyway, even if something passes in 21. Um, but that's something folks are watching. Another kind of policy related question, um, jump in as you see fit, you know, um, recycled content mandates. Folks are wondering if that has any beneficial downstream effect on municipalities. Um, for context, California did pass, became the first state this year to pass recycled content requirements for plastic beverage containers that will be phased in over the next few years. Um, no, Washington state got close, the governor vetoed it over pandemic um, concerns, but others may follow New Jersey's looking pretty closely at this. Any thoughts to call out there, or I guess just broadly on, you know, efforts to improve the value of plastic uh, outside of the regulatory structure that maybe could be beneficial financially to municipalities. Are there either of you hearing anything along those lines? So um, we, the, the partnership kind of released a, a framework for this, which um, I'll, I'll, I'll find the link and I'll put it in the chat or maybe we can send it a link out afterwards. Um, but we got some, you know, we, we brought some folks around the table and got major brands to support um, some sort of packaging fee, uh, and I, I don't want to go all into it, but but a core process, A, because I don't have time, and B, I'm not the expert, but a core kind of functional cornerstone of, of, of our framework is um, kind of direct to communities support, um, operational support. And so, as you mentioned, that there is, uh, it's, it's a long time in the making, and it's not final by any means, but, um, but to get major, major brands to support a fee on their packaging is a, a, a huge leap compared to what a lot of people thought was, imagin was imaginable 10 or even five or three years ago. Um, so I think we are, we're very proud of that work and, and I'll make sure I find the link so everyone can read more into it. But, um, but I think that is, I'm not sure how it will affect communities in, you know, the, in the two to five year range, but, but I think brands are moving in that direction. It's, it's no longer so anathema to their, um, to their business to consider it. Um, so I think that's good. Um, anything you'd want to add on that Vita? If not, no worries. Cool. Um, and one other on the policy front um, that also has come up in multiple questions, so I'll address this. EPA set, uh, recently set a goal to hit a 50% recycling rate by 2030. Um, voluntary goal, not a mandatory goal. Um, key focus areas that they've outlined, the strategy still being finalized, um, education, infrastructure, market development. Do folks foresee any downstream benefits from you know um, areas that are struggling financially right now is this uh, something that you're even hearing come up as something folks are optimistic about when you're having these budget discussions with them sounds like not so much <laughs> no i mean that's yeah it's almost more of an uh, ambition based goal where right now everybody's just really focused on keeping the lights on um so there, there's i don't know i don't Maybe Vincent is different with you. I don't hear a whole lot of talk about it. No, I mean that's it's. I think it's good to have that. It's good to have that ambition. It's good to have a, a something to shoot for. But I, um, I couldn't really speak in depth on that either. Um, it's 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 a little too soft to to really nail down. Yeah, I so far I've, I've heard folks are intrigued by it, you know, and just based very uh, anecdotally on traffic on our, when we wrote a story about it, people clicked on it, people read it, but I don't know that it necessarily, like you said, it doesn't help folks struggling right now. Um, one other that is more near term and is a good question. Um, granted, we have focused more on, you know, municipalities and that's kind of what the focus is here, but I think 
uh, clearly commercial recycling is affected quite a bit as well. Commercial generators are many of the businesses of various sizes that have been hit hard by the pandemic closures, this and that. And, and on the other side, the um, processors that either haul or handle the material at the MRPs, if you rely on commercial recycling, this is challenging for you too, volumes are still down. Um, Anything either of you have heard on that? I know this may not be something you work on directly, but any any thoughts on you know pandemic effects on commercial recycling this year? I mean, I can just tell you what I've seen in terms of developing rates, and that has been going on since the market shifted. Again, it no longer became kind of a, a small money loser. It now became very expensive to deal with recycling, and what would, had often happened is that encouraging businesses to recycle was done in the form of a free recycling dumpster to go along with your solid waste dumpster or a very discounted, or you would get a discount on your solid waste rate if you had recycling as well. And it, we just reached a point where now we need to really look at the cost of service and start to have a stated rate. Uh, and, and that can still work because the, in general, anyway, solid waste is still gonna cost more so there is an advantage to recycling, but you have to be able, again, to, to reach out to the businesses to talk about that. Um, but you know, that's the shift I've seen in terms of, of making rates. Uh, the only thing I could really add, and it's sort of very general and basic, but you know, just add, review the sizes of your dumpsters and your services and just make sure that they're right sized for your operations. Um, because again, as we, as, as recycling is moving into a, a, this kind of a, a service, um, a paid for service, um, so, uh, there were, there have been anecdotally, of course, um, you know, some folks were, had a service or a, a level of service that they was fine because it was free or so cheap. And that, that is, as that has changed, um, just be cognizant if you don't actually need that level. And, and um, you know, if it's, if we're going to construe this as a, as a service and as a fee, then, then be mindful of that, you know, most folks don't pay for electricity. They don't need, they don't pay for water. They don't need, if you don't need that big dumpster, if you don't need the weekly service or whatever it is, then I would reach out to your hall or processor, whomever it is, just as you would any other kind of line item in your business, um, because, because it's changing and, and we'll have to adapt to that across the board. Well, I think that kind of worked itself out at the start of this pandemic, right? When all the shutdown happened, you know, I always try to keep in touch with my clients, but reaching out to them, like, what are you doing about commercial? And, you know, universally, everyone went down to the lowest level of service possible. So they're not going to let you pull your service entirely. You're still an open business. You're required to have a dumpster. But um, if it was the time to downsize or go down to one pickup per week, you know, over time, I think people are right sizing according to the conditions that they're in now. I'd be surprised if there were someone who still hadn't thought about that at this point. But yeah, it's definitely it's definitely the first approach is to make sure that you're getting the level and size level of service and size container that you need. And I, just since I mean we sort of mentioned it earlier, but I think the same is true of municipalities. Do you need weekly pickup? Do you need uh, some bi week like twice a week pickup like you know uh if your if your recyclables are appropriately cleaned and sorted then you know i don't put my recycling out for weeks at a time because they're fine it's just paper and plastic in a tub it's not a big deal um and so there are i think i think municipalities and even maybe residents themselves could take a take ownership of that same style of work and right sizing uh, their services as needed particularly with like organics and brush and large collections. Um, you know, not only should Vita, as you've uh, mentioned, you know, not only should be, should we be reassessing those as a, as a source of fees, but what is, what is their utility to driving a brush truck around the entire town once a week? Uh, Versus on call service, right? And a lot of, a lot of municipalities have done that recently. That's just a good way in general as you're you know, suffering financially to consider things. What are we doing that on the surface when you think about it, it's just a waste of time. And you know, yeah, a brush truck checking everybody's homes to see if someone threw a log out is, is not the best way to spend your day. Um, so you know, not even a specific maybe miscellaneous charge every time, but just really decreasing the amount of time your drivers have to spend on the route by making it a call-in service. 
And with uh, recycling, actually we're working with a recycling partnership coming up pretty soon um, on talking to a city about just decreasing the frequency of recycling pickup. Um, so like you said, it doesn't tend to smell the way solid waste does. And, and you know, depending on the regulations in your area, at least with residential, it should be okay to move to every other week instead of every week. And there could be some real advantages there. Yeah. Uh, so there has been kind of a, I've had a, a, dis, a few discussions just with, with colleagues about that. Cause I'm a big proponent of, of every other week collection um, for the reasons I mentioned, but I, I heard recently from, from a friend and colleague, you know, what we talk about a lot is putting access to recycling services on the same level as trash services. And so they wanted them correct, collected weekly so that they're kind of equal service. And uh, I just don't, that might be true in an ideal world, but I would not set that as an expectation in such financially trying times. Interesting. Um, well, as we wind down, there was, you know, one more thing I wanted to get at and please, you know, use this as an opportunity to any other, you know, parting thoughts and thanks to folks to all the questions, apologies, we couldn't get to them. Um, please feel free to follow up by email. I think that it's way to please feel free to share my email. I'm happy to stay in touch with folks. Um, you know, as we'll see if Congress passes, <clears throat> excuse me, something this week, we don't know how long this is all going to go. We know that we're not out of the woods yet by any Stretch of the imagination, there could be other municipalities making these tough decisions in the coming months or even years for the reasons we outlined. What should they keep in mind if there is any element of a choice? If it's, you know, if they, if they do have the choice, even if it's a hard one of keep the program or pause the program or keep collecting the stuff, but don't send it to the MRF, what factors should they keep in mind about how, how hard it might be to reverse that decision? You know, if, uh, if you're going to pull the carts or you're going to train everyone, just throw it in there, but we're not actually going to recycle it or and what, what should folks keep in mind there or any parting thoughts on how to try to keep their programs afloat financially? I'll start with Vincent. Um, so things to consider are uh, suspending a program or canceling it is also can be cost prohibitive getting rid of those carts, storing carts, especially if you already got truck infrastructure, which is just so hard to replace. Um, and so I would look at that. I would look at how much are you willing to kind of re-educate your residents for creatures of habit? And, and that is just the reality. So if, if you've already got a strong recycling program that's just being hit, um, that, that's, a, that's a hard thing to recover. Um, you know, there's a certain amount of, I think we should, as much as possible strive to build trust in our recycling programs and so when they're kind of when they're confusing or stop start um that degrades that trust and it's really hard to build back uh and then the the final thing i would say is really avail yourself as much as possible to the resources um of course i'm going to highlight our own we have several free resources we are not the only folks in the field though um and so i would i would see what you can get for free because um, we've got signage, we have anti-contamination tools, we've got some other best management practices, um, we've got just technical assistance we, we want to support communities. And so before you make the, what I would say is the leap or a plunge to, get to suspending a program, um, just do your homework, I guess. That sounds blasé, but I don't mean it that way, like really do your homework. Um, we would generally approach it in, the, in terms of a cost benefit analysis, which needs to take into account both things. What are, what are the costs of not just having recycling, but what are your fixed costs? I mean, if you discontinue your recycling program, are you really laying people off? Um, you know, how, are you really getting rid of equipment? You know, what's going away? Because you find often you're not, the savings is not the cost of the operation. Uh, the savings is whatever incremental portion you can get rid of and then consider the barriers to re-entry when you change your mind in a couple of years and realize that now it is financially feasible for you to have that program back. It would make a lot more sense in most cases to just reduce the frequency of collection you know, during a difficult time than it would be to try and just end a program. Um, and then again, looking for any, any resources that are available in terms of grants, matching funds, anything else whether, you know, right outside of the recycling program that could free up some funds to be able to consider it. Great. Well, thank you both for taking the time to discuss today. And um, thanks to Be Wastewise for hosting us. I appreciated the conversation.
Thank you, Cole. Thank you, Vincent, and thank you, Vita. Uh, thanks a lot, first of all, for joining in really early. I think it was pretty early in the morning for you. And uh, but I hope the audience made it worth it because we had a very engaging audience. So thanks a lot to the audience for tuning in so early as well. Uh, and uh, just today is the last panel of 2020. We really hope 2021 would be better in many different ways, as uh, all of us, I'm sure, are hoping the same. So uh, have a good end of the year good holiday season and uh, this webinar will be up on our website in two weeks time before that you will continue to have access to it uh, via zoom and you will get an email about it so thanks a lot uh, bye bye folks have a good day everyone